I just built a drill press table with super cool features. It has a split fence design that's free to do any angle and go behind the column line when the entire throat depth is needed. Tiny flip stop blocks can be easily set to perfect dimensions with included measuring tape. The elevation of the table is done at the front thanks to an angle miter gear setup that keeps the crank flush with the front of the table. It also has a flipped up table extension and a replaceable insert. So let's see how I made it. Boom! My first step in making a drill press table was actually to watch YouTube videos to get inspired. Some of the ideas I will implement in this project are not original, but I guess this is precisely why the maker community shares their experiences, am I right? So, after checking the CNC movements around the drill press, I took measurements to ensure that my table would fit within the available space. You can see that I don't have much space around it, but I was sure I could still build something really cool. To create the base, I used leftover material from old projects. I glued an 8mm piece of red Valchromat to this 18mm plywood board to make it more solid. This video is sponsored by Rocker Woodworking Hardware and you'll see me using a few of their tools and accessories throughout this build. In the description there's a complete list of tools for your reference. Once I was happy with the amount of weights and paint cans to help with the glue up, I called it a day and waited for the next morning. It seemed flat enough, so let's go to the table saw and trim the edges. With the crosscut sled, I trimmed one perpendicular edge and rubbed my fingers across the freshly cut face flush with the fence just for a dopamine boost. I then divided between what's going to be the main table and the extension wing. I removed the sled and cut the extension to its final width. I used this old compass I got from my mom, yes mom, it's still here with me, I haven't lost it, and trace half a circle that I'll cut out to fit around the drill press column. I drew the cutout shape and a circle representing the replaceable insert on the computer to cut with the laser as a template. I cut the bulk of the material with a jigsaw, staying away from the line. I centered the top and marked the center line with a bread point bit. I don't want the insert, which will be round, to have its center at the center of the chuck because that would make all drilling occur in the same place, which is not what we want for a table insert. By off-centering it, I can drill a hole, rotate the insert plate, drill again and always get a fresh support under the workpiece. When that insert is full of holes, I can turn it upside down and when that side is also fully utilized, swap to a new insert. To route that hole, I will use the template stuck to the workpiece with double-sided tape and a flush cutting bit with a shallow length of cut. The bearing will run against the template and the tip will munch on the red Valchromat. I will insert a collar reducer because this is a quarter inch bit and my router has an 8mm collet. 
To collect the dust, I installed this crappy little plastic dust attachment that broke on the first or second use, but it's what I have. At least it still collects most of the dust. I made this in two passes to reach the desired depth. I can remove the template and stick it at the top to copy the half circle on the router table. I'm using the Rockler Pro Lift and a compression flush trimming bit here. It turned out perfect. I can take the ride and make several copies of the insert plates. While at the router table, I changed the bit again for a 3 quarter inch straight one and dialed the depth of cut to a hair deeper than the T tracks I'll be installing in the tabletop. I did a first test on a scrap to check the correct depth. Since I'll be routing dados, most of the dust will be projected to the front of the router table. So I'll attach this Rockler dado dust chute. It will collect the dust that would land on the floor and create a huge mess. And it did suck, most of it. At least I couldn't find any red dust on the floor after these cuts. Whoops, something happened here. Okay, I'm not sure if I should have been pressing the piece against the table a bit harder or if this was too much for the bit to handle, so I lowered it and resumed the job doing it in two passes. Unfortunately, this data was beaten up and I know, I know, this is a sharp project, I could just ignore it, but of course I can't. I, I had to shape two tiny pieces to match these bytes. With the final pass, that dado become perfect again. Let's move into cutting some aluminum tea track at the table saw. You will allow me to conveniently secure the split fans and clamps whenever needed. I changed the blade to a multi-material one because I feel safer using it due to the shape of the teeth and the type of shavings that it produces. You can certainly use a regular wood cutting blade. Keep in mind though that the cuts might not come out as clean and instead of shavings, large birds might be created that fly more unpredictably with aggressive sharp edges. Because the drill press is very close to the studio door pathway, I cut the left corner of the tabletop so I wouldn't bump against it and hurt myself. It was quickly done with the large protractor fence in the Rockler crosscut sled.
first I cut the aluminum track and then swapped for the wood cutting blade to cut the tabletop. Now, to be able to pop out the center insert, a through hole needs to be drilled in alignment with the hole in the cast iron table. I confidently marked the center point using the template and went to the drill press to drill it. For some reason it seemed weird to me that this point wasn't reachable. It doesn't fit. And of course it had a reason. Remember when I off-centered the circular recess with the router? Well, I kept going and thought, okay, I can do it with the drill press, let's find another way to drill a perfectly vertical hole. I got the portable drill guide off the shelf and attached a Forstner bit. I took my time drilling the hole halfway, then flipped it over and kept drilling to prevent blowouts. So careful and cute, only to find out that no! <laughs> it was supposed to be off-center. Oh. The point was to find new material to sacrifice when rotating the insert. Okay. To drill that hole in the correct place, I had to clamp the tabletop really well to prevent wandering of the large bit and start slowly chewing up the plywood. I tested the popping by inserting a dowel into the cast iron table. Nice! To secure the new table to the cast iron, I'll be using magnets. It's one of the ideas I grabbed from the research I did. I went into my magnet drawer and found these strong ones that can hold up to 6.5 kilograms each. They also have this countersunk hole in the middle that is perfect to screw onto material. As you can imagine, they're very difficult to pull from each other. That's why they come packed with a plastic washer in between. They're really, really hard to separate if they get stuck together. And it might be dangerous too. I had a colleague who got a nasty bruise from two strong magnets getting attracted with a bit of skin of her forearm in between. Ouch! It was pretty difficult for us to help her release them. So I always maneuver magnets carefully, ensuring they are far away from one another. The power of attraction is just too hard. I embedded two and tested them. It was already good, but I felt it could be even better, so I added another pair. The resistance is much higher now, with 26 kilograms of force pulling the table down. To help lock the table in place, I added three pieces of maple to make a barrier along the perimeter. Most of the table is done, it's time to start working on the fence. I decided to make the fence with an offcut of the same material. It just seemed easy enough and fairly straight for this purpose. I routed another dado for T-Track, split it in half and made a stopped groove through the material that will allow for unrestricted movement in the tabletop tracks. The split fence concept was also something I took from other videos. I do like to be credited, everyone likes to, so I'll have a list below with the videos I grabbed inspiration from to come out with my design. I 
wasn't digging the red-blue color scheme, so I painted the tracks matte black. Sorry, Rockler! Three coats of black paint and two coats of clear spray lacquer. The next day, I sanded and finished the surface. I double checked the depth of the dados before finishing and one of them needed a little more depth. This meant a great chance to use my Cat's Moses router plane. I mixed some hard wax soil and spread it over the surface with an application pad on the orbital sander set at the lowest speed. To connect the flip-up table extension, we need hinges. And although I'm sure you could use simple and expensive ones, I wanted to try a more fancy solution and use concealed door hinges. It will be my second time installing this kind of hinge and I saw this as an excellent chance to practice. The sauce hinges come with instructions and a template to ease up installation. It was a matter of transferring the whole placement, drilling to the correct depth and hogging out the remaining material with a chisel. I repeated the process for all four pockets and screwed the hinges to the tabletop. When I checked it for alignment, they were slightly off. Maybe the Forstner bit did move while adapting to the plywood layers. Well, I traced a line at the back of the extension, trimmed it off and refinished it. To match the matte black tea tracks, I used black wood screws. Okay, cool. Now let's face the biggest problem with drill press tables. It all seems amazing until the point you realize that the crank gets blocked and you can no longer adjust the height. A simple solution is to make a cutout in the table corner, 
but that defeats the purpose of having a split fence since you can no longer store the, or clamp the fence back there. An interesting idea is to transpose the elevation crank to the front of the table. To do that, I use mounted gears to create a 90 degree angle and an extension rod to where the crank will be attached. This makes raising and lowering the table much more convenient and you don't have to awkwardly reach your arm across the right side of the table. Finding the correct placement for all the hardware isn't that hard. It's not easy either, so bear with me while I try to explain what I did. After attaching one of the gears to the original shaft, I used the line laser to find the proper distance between the center point of rotation and the base of the table. I chose 30 centimeters as the desired length of the rod to keep the crank under the table, avoiding protrusions. That is very proximate to the dimension of an A4 paper sheet. I traced a horizontal line more or less in the middle of the paper and by trial and error I found that an inclination of 5 degrees seemed enough to operate the crank without my hand hitting the underside of the table. This might be different depending on your drill press. I grabbed the piece with the measurement I'd just taken and traced the line to represent the tabletop. The idea is to make two support pieces that lock the rod with the crank and the miter gears in place. The one closer to the gear will have the hole to pass the rod through right at the start of the line. I will then cut a 5 degree angle at the top and leave extra material at the base with no specific dimension. I used some scraps of Baltic birch plywood to do this. Just ignore these old pocket screw holes here. So the hole was drilled and the 5 degree angle was cut. I repeated the procedure for the second support at the opposite side of the rod, only aligning the hole and top of the support with the other side of the paper. The holes I drilled were 16 mm in diameter and my rod is 40 mm, which is the dimension of the original crank and shaft on my drill press. It may vary from machine to machine. I made that hole larger to insert steel bushings and keep the movement smooth and wobble free over time. This is what it will look like. I can now drill pocket holes at convenient places. Again, just ignore these two old ones. The front support piece needs to be cut to fit around the cast iron table. To lock the components in place, I also attach two stop collars. Okay, let's test it out. Off camera, I positioned the contraption the best way I could using clamps. I can now drive the screws. I can see some flexing of the front support when the crank is lifting the table. I'll fix that with a triangular piece. Unfortunately, my camera died right before the cut so, here's the triangle. After screwing it in place, the movement became much smoother. I can now cut the remaining steel rod using my mini angle grinder. For a better look, I cut a trapezoidal shape from the red valchromat and stuck it with magnets. The table is practically done and the mechanical problem is solved. I can start making two small flip stop blocks for the fence. 
I started with a 20 by 20 millimeter aluminum square bar that I will shape as I can. I don't have metal working tools, so I mainly use the table saw and hand tools. I started by shaping a runner to fit inside the T-Track. The blade left interior corners that were not sharp due to the triple chip ground teeth format. I used the scoring tool to remove material along those inner edges. I cut two sections of 30mm each and drilled holes for the T-Track knobs and the flip stops. I started with an undersized hole that I could then cut threads for the M6 bolts. These are the bolts holding the flip pieces. I selected the T-Track bolts and knobs for both the stops and fans from this Rockler Jig hardware kit. These are the smaller ones and seem great to use with the fans. They look too big for the stop blocks, but that's what I have for now and they will work just fine. To give them a nicer look and feel, I sanded all sides to 600 grit and made all the sharp edges smoother. I cut the flip pieces from 5mm acrylic with the laser machine. They will go together like this. They turn out pretty cute nonetheless. To prevent the bolt from turning and unscrewing when flipping the acrylic, I put a few drops of thread lock. About dust collection. After giving it some thought, I decided to order the lock line system. I got a slide valve, an adapter for 2.5 inch hose and a couple of nozzles. I'll be fixing this dust coupler from Rockler to the wall. 
One side will get the CNC hose that is now shared with the drill press. I have no affiliation to this product, but it seems a good option for an adjustable system and easy enough to install. Oh, it looks promising. I'm excited to have this collection in my drill press for the first time. I guess that sucking the air from behind works best. Ah, I forgot to turn on this collector. There you go. Great! Now I will make the final touches. One of them is embedding a washer where friction and force will be applied when clamping the table extension support. I can make the final installation and by the way, yes, this can be removed as a whole and put back in place with the gear teeth matching. Now I have support for drilling long and large work pieces. The last detail I did was to install sticky measuring tape to the fence. It's metal and it has some thickness, so I routed a very shallow dado to make it flush with the surface. And it's finally complete! A drill press featuring a split fence, conveniently equipped with flip stop locks and measuring tape. The frontal crank works really well. I love that it is flush with the front of the table. The repositionable and replaceable insert was a nice addition too, just like the flip-up table extension. Having T-Track installed is great for using various clamps whenever needed. And the best part is that none of this interferes with dust collection. Alright, I hope you enjoyed this one and now it's your turn to get your hands dirty! Ta -ta -ta.